Well, good morning. Uh, welcome <clears throat> to both uh, Trinity and Prince of Glory and our time of worship. Uh, my name is Pastor Phil Hemke, and I have been pastor previously at Beautiful Savior in uh, Bloomfield Hills, and then I was Director of Church Relations for Lutheran Social Service of Michigan, or Samaritas, for eight years. And I've had the privilege of coming both to Trinity and to Prince of Glory uh, to preach over those years. And even more than that, I've had the privilege of being really good friends with Pastor John Siefkin at uh, Prince of Glory and uh, uh, the pastors at, uh, at Trinity, uh, Carl Bloom especially, I knew pretty well, and Matt Lash. So a joy to be with you today to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ in our community. So we invite all of you to uh, uh, join us in this worship this morning. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who was in the beginning, who makes a dwelling among us, who covers us with justice and mercy. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. God of goodness and loving kindness, Hear the good news of peace and salvation. God, forgive us all our sins, not through our own work, but through Jesus Christ. Make known to all people, with all who come to the manger, rejoice in this amazing gift of grace. Amen. We'll continue now with our gathering song, Good Christian Friends Rejoice. Let us pray. Almighty God, you wonderfully created the dignity of human nature and yet more wonderfully restored it. In your mercy, let us share the divine life of the one who came to share our humanity, Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We'll continue now with the scripture readings. Good morning. This morning, the first reading is from Isaiah, chapter 61, verses 10 and 62, 3. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exalt in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth 
forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. The vindication and the salvation of Zion. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. The word of the Lord. Glory to you, O Lord. The second reading today is Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born as a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The gospel this morning is Luke, chapter 2, verses 41 through 52. The boy Jesus in the temple. Now, every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Assuming that he was in a group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. He said to them, Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. The word of the Lord. The lesson we have for today is the gospel lesson, Luke 2. And the key words, I think, are, I must be about my father's business. And uh, as I said, it's a joy to be with you today. And in particular, uh, <clears throat> I'm just delighted to have been asked to preach on this lesson. And let me tell you why. I'd like to see the, uh, the slide that you were seeing uh, before. So this slide uh, that you're seeing about Jesus in the temple. So Jesus is standing in the temple and he's amongst, amongst the leaders of the temple, the Pharisees and the scribes. And I, the picture you're seeing is unique because actually it was a wedding gift to my mother and father in 1938. 
And uh, back then, a wedding gift of Jesus in the temple probably wouldn't be an outstanding wedding gift, you know, but my, my mother was the daughter of a Lutheran pastor, and I suspect he just took it off the wall and gave it to my mom and dad as a wedding gift. But uh, as a kid, as a little kid, I, the picture was hanging in our living room for many years, and I remember I used to lie on the floor and walk by that picture, and I looked at this picture all the time. I, I would look especially at the eyes of Jesus, and then at the eyes of the Pharisees and scribes looking at him, and then I'd watch the hands and the motions of the hands, and basically, I gotta tell you, I pondered that picture for a long time, and so now the, the chance to uh, preach on that text, to me, is very exciting. So uh, if you can see me again, that might be, be helpful at this point. Uh, this is our lesson for today. This picture about Jesus in the temple. And this is one of the only stories, this is the only story in the scripture that describes Jesus in the years before his ministry. There's only one story in the scripture. And I tell you, there's many stories from parallel uh, books about the Gospels that were not accepted by the early Christian church. These legends never made it into the Bible because the scripture writers were interested in the Gospel of Jesus Christ. They weren't interested in the miraculous stories of how he did this or this as a child. So that's really good news for us. The supernatural wasn't attracting their eyes. What they were looking at was the core work of what Jesus did for us. Now, the author of this book is Luke. And what's interesting about Luke is uh, he's a doctor. He's a Gentile. It means he's not Jewish background. Uh, he was a sidekick of St. Paul, hang out, hung out with St. Paul because Paul was doing the ministry to the Gentiles. Luke was one of his partners. And the book is written to Theophilus. Now, we think Theophilus is a real person, but at the same time, Theophilus translates from the Greek this way lovers of God. And we know that, that Luke is now writing to all the people there, then, and now. To you. Luke is writing to you and to me. Theophilus. Uh, by the way, lovers of God, I want to tell you this story. So what we have here is Jesus is in the 12th year of his uh, life. And what we learn from Luke is, in this story, that he puts a big value on uh, eyewitness, eyewitness accounts. So when St. Paul was imprisoned in Jerusalem, I mean, he was imprisoned in Jerusalem and Caesarea, Luke was a sidekick. And Luke hung around with Paul in town, and he went and did interviews for his Bible that he was going to be writing. We are pretty confident that this story came directly from the mouth of Jesus' mother, Mary. That Mary told Luke this story about Jesus' childhood, maybe other stories, but this is the one that made it into our scripture. And the story reveals that Mary pondered these things in her heart. Uh, Luke's gospel is, is rich with this understanding. Uh, so today, Theophilus, or God lovers, what I'd like you to do is to ponder this lesson and to ponder these words in your heart uh, and let them soak in and think about it. So I'm just going to walk through the story because it's rich with context and depth. Now the parents went up to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. What's this telling us? It says Jesus' parents were very, very solid core church people. And they took serious the law, they took serious the commandments, and they went to church. Later on, what Jesus got in trouble over was not that he was not a Jewish person, but he challenged authority. And then the people in authority and Jesus were contesting that he said he was the son of God. And that became a major issue for Jesus in his relationship to the Jewish community. What's verse 42 says? And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom. So 12th year, he's 12 years old. They go up to the temple. This is the year for a young person, like we have 13 to be confirmed. This is a year for a young person to be bar mitzvahed. Or to become, bar mitzvah means to become a son of the commandment. 
And so Jesus was in the process of, of doing that, of being bar mitzvah that year. Verse 43 and 44. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning the boy, Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents didn't know it. But supposing him to be in the company, they went a day's journey. In today's term, they got in their car in Minneapolis and drove all the way to Chicago to find out Jesus wasn't there with them. <laughs> you know? And uh, they walked 30 miles or so. But this was not uncommon because people would travel in groups. They were all cousins and family. And very often the kids would be off moving along in a gang of five, six, seven, and the parents over here. Uh, at first, it looks like maybe Jesus was disobeying his parents. But I think a deeper look at this says, the parents were trusting Jesus. He didn't give them any reason not to trust them. If he wasn't trustable, they'd kept their eye on their kid to make sure he was coming along. And that wasn't the case. Verse 43 says, they sought him among their kinfolk and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. After three days, they found him in the temple. So I said, families traveled in groups. And then we'll look at verse 40, 46. They found him in the temple among the teachers, listening to them, asking them questions, and all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Now, this is a real neat thing to look at. In this story, 12-year-old Jesus looks like he's being approved uh, by the teachers. But I bet you that they were looking at him and thinking, okay, the kid's 12. He's pretty knowledgeable. Okay, Junior, you're okay. But that may not be the case if he was 26 or 27, or as we know, 30 years old. And, and it's easy to do that. And, you know, we have the similar story today. I've known of a story where a non-church-going family let their eight-year-old girl go to Sunday school with a neighbor kid. And the little girl went to Sunday school and heard about Jesus and came home just bubbling with excitement and telling her parents, the non-churchgoers, Jesus is Lord and Savior. And mom and dad kind of pat her on the head. Okay, honey, that's okay. But then you wonder, as she gets older and still contends that, that's exactly what happened to Jesus. As time went on, you remember in Scripture it says to, about Jesus, and he turned to the crowd and he said, so I want you to hear, those who are not with me are against me. Pretty strong words. So the second thing you learn from this little story about Jesus' encounter in the temple, I think, is something very profound. We are here talking about the divinity of Jesus Christ. And we can understand better what this verse means with the scripture from St. Paul in Philippians. And you probably know this verse because it goes this way. Though Jesus was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God something that he needed to reach for. But he emptied himself, as taking the form of a servant. What, what's this teaching us? Jesus emptied himself of his omniscience, of his all-knowing ability. How that happens, we just have no clue. Uh, Remember, there was a scripture in Matthew that said these words. Of that day, said Jesus, and of that hour, when the end is going to come, Jesus said, of that day and hour, the angels in heaven don't know, the Son doesn't know, only the Father does. Jesus is asking the scribes and the Pharisees to teach him. This scripture says that Jesus increased in wisdom, he increased in wisdom. True God, true man. <laughs> We're over our head and in, in depth stuff. But what we learn here is the incarnate Christ somehow, some amazingly way, exercised his divine powers he, to stay in a relationship with the will of God and the understanding of God, but that he restrained his powers on knowledge. And the child standing in the temple then, here's the learning for us, isn't much different than us or our kids. They needed to increase in wisdom, says the text. It's sitting right there. He increased in wisdom. And this brings me to the third point of this little, this verse. 
And uh, this is what triggered in my mind. And both of our congregations here have really had a good history of, of this. Let me share with you. What are the four things Jesus did here in this lesson? He sought out wise teachers. He listened. He asked questions. He gave answers. Amazing. Our God, true man, true God, Jesus, sought out teachers, listened, asked questions, gave answers. God lovers, clue in. <laughs> this is what we're called to do. God lovers are seekers. And that's what was exciting in my ministry, that there were so many people who were seekers, uh, trying to learn uh, to take the whole scripture and to put it together and understand what does life mean? <clears throat> What's my place in life? How do I fit in? Where does the gospel of Jesus Christ fit into my life? So I wanna urge, urge everyone who's listening today, uh, take these words to heart and just ponder them in your heart. Find yourself a wise teacher, uh, someone who loves the whole counsel of God, someone who will ask you questions and make you think, someone who you can ask questions to, and someone who will answer your questions. Well, you had a good one here at Prince of Glory and John Siefkin. I know that. He was a great teacher. He loved to do that. And uh, I know at Trinity, a long history of people, Matt, Lash, and, and uh, Carl Bloom loved the scripture and taught people. This is a key thing. And I hope your new pastors that are coming, the pastor coming, will be one who knows the whole counsel of God. Jesus grew in wisdom, and so should we. Uh, it's, it's interesting that uh, we talk about this. I remember the first year I did confirmation in 1970 was the year we switched over from, we'd have the kids up in the past, and maybe some of you were confirmed in the Lutheran tradition. There were 400 questions, and you'd get a question thrown at you. You'd have to answer it. So we switched it, and we then let them pick their own Bible verse, and they pondered it. And then we spent months working with them to write a two-page paper, and they would deliver their own paper to the congregation. And what I loved about it was it made them ponder. It made them think. And then I loved about it is I sat there, and they were here, and I learned. I was overwhelmed by what some young people would say, and I'm thinking, that's in there? You know, and what an exciting thing it was to have that happen. Uh, and... I, I love that in the church. And you know what I want to say about teaching? Raise the bar, don't lower it. Offer more, not less. Raise the bar, because people need to be challenged. Our church needs to grow wider and deeper in the faith. So this lesson really teaches us, get deeper, get deeper. And you do that through pondering. Now, the last little section I want to touch in this verse is the most dynamic one there is. Here's the, here's the words. And when they, his parents, saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been looking for you. And you could put in there anxiously, in pain. Where have you been? We didn't know anything. And Jesus said to his parents, Why is it that you sought me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house about his business? And they did not understand the saying which he spoke to them. Here's the contrast. Your father and mother are worried about you. I need to be in my father's house. Your father's worried. I'm in my father's house doing my father's business. What's stunning here is they were searching for Jesus. Where did they look? Did they go into town and look at the playground? Did they go into town and look at the swimming hole, uh, the bakery? Did they go to the shops? They went to church. Interesting. And the main point, Jesus says back to him, you shouldn't be seeking for me at all, mom, dad. I found it. I want you to know at 12, I found what I need to do. I'm, I'm, I'm there. Uh, I understand my inner, inner calling now. I have to be about my father's business. And that's my calling. 
And Jesus has chosen the crucial stage in his life at 12 years old, on the brink of manhood, to tell his parents what his life mission is going to be. Very, very, very powerful for us. As Simeon said, and in just a few verses later, Mary, he says to Mary, a sword is going to pierce your heart at what's going to happen to your son. And you and I know the story uh, that he died on the cross to suffer for the sins of the world, better yet for Theophilus, for all the God lovers, for all people everywhere. Jesus recognizes his unique sonship and he recognizes his mission and his devotion to God. So Luke is really setting the stage for the ministry of Jesus that is to be coming. So if you will, uh, the takeaway, the takeaway for this day is to call everyone here just to once again ponder the works of God in the scripture and what the Lord Jesus has done. Uh, we are learning more and more in the world. We hear through media, through everything. Your goal in life is to be more inclusive. But I want to say something this morning to that. I think that's the wrong place to go. Not that we shouldn't get there. But let me say it in the way I think this lesson says it. Our main goal is to have a deeper relationship with Jesus. Our main goal is to have a deeper relationship with the Lord. And we know that, as Paul says, in Christ, we are connected to the whole world. We are connected to white and black, to, to every nation. We are connected to people all over. In Christ, I can relate to everyone because Christ is the one who redeems us and makes us whole. So may the spirit of Jesus, uh, who teaches us to grow in wisdom, be amongst us as we grow in our love of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I'd like you to pray with me, please. Come Holy Spirit, be upon everyone who is listening here this morning. Help each of us in our life journey. Help us to find our vocation, whether it be an engineer or a pastor, whether it be a, a treasurer, whatever role. Help us see our vocation in you and grow in wisdom of your relationship to us in the world. Help us seek out teachers who help us grow in our knowledge of the Lord. Help us listen better. Help us ask good questions and help us shape good answers that we can give to our children and those around us. Bless the work of Trinity and Prince of Glory as you grow in your depth of the love of Jesus Christ and strengthen people everywhere. In Jesus' name, bless us. Amen.
We invite all of you to join together with us in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was in the time, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of Amen. Please join in prayer of intercession. And <clears throat> we want to put our voices together with the Song of Angels. And let us pray for the church, the world, and all who our seekers in this time. Lord, night and day, creation praises you. Strengthen your church across nations, denominations, and traditions. Fill us with wisdom. Fill us with the desire for wisdom. And unify our proclamation of your forgiveness through Jesus Christ and his mercy for the world. Hear us, O God. All creation is holy to you, O God. You cause the earth to bring forth its shoots and gardens to spring up. Protect hibernating animals and frozen lands that wait earnestly for longer days of awakening and growth. Hear us, O God. The nations are upheld by your hand, O God. Bring righteousness and praise into the land, inspire leaders to serve with compassion and dignity. We boldly ask you send your spirit of discernment upon our legislators grappling with complex decisions. Give them urgency for the sake of the common good. Hear us, O God. Send the spirit of your son into our hearts, O God. Come quickly to the hearts that race with fear. We are filled with fear these days. And we have hearts that are breaking with grief, hearts that long for your wholeness. There are so many who are uh, at home and alone today. Be with them, Lord. Spread your power upon those who are suffering from illnesses, especially this COVID disease. Give them strength, Lord. Be with each of us so that we become people Uh, offering ourselves for the healing of others. Give us your power. Give us healing and save us, O Lord. Hear us, O God. Thank you, Lord, for adopting us into your family through Jesus Christ. Bless our elders with the peace and the joy of Simeon and Anna. Strengthen those who have retired, those who work in older age, those in need of income, food, company, or health care. Connect the young and old across generations and be with our young people and give them hope and encouragement for the days to come. Hear us, O God. Let us depart in peace, O God, according to your word. Prepare our salvation. Give us the witness of your presence and the assurance that of every time and place, both past, present, and future, you will be there, Lord. Hear us, O God. God of mercy, come quickly with us. Bring grace upon grace as we lift those in all our prayers to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We'll now receive our offering and we encourage all of you who are listening as well, uh, be faithful in your giving of yourself to others of time, talents, and treasures. Because the ministry of the church needs you right where you are, and the churches of Trinity and Prince of Glory need your support, your blessing, and encouragement to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Indeed, by the Holy Spirit, be generous in your giving to God's work. Our offering prayer. Gracious God, you came to us as one unknown, bringing joy and salvation to the earth. 
Nourish us at your banquet table, that with all who welcome your birth, we may proclaim your peace, revealed in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Now continue with our communion service, indeed the presence of Christ, and at home you should have your preparation of, of uh, the host and the wine or the uh, uh, other juice, grape juice, what you should have. And we we'll begin this service then with the words of institution, and then I'll invite you to commune with us at that moment. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat, this is my body given into death for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then after the supper, he took the cup. When he had supped and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it. This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you, for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. I'll commune myself first and then invite you to commune at that point. body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you for the remission of sins. Do this in remembrance of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray together at this point the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. The word of God is revealed in a manger, in simple bread and wine. Receive the presence of Christ today with power and strength. So let us pray, thanking the Lord. Thank you, Lord, gracious God, that you have once again fed us with your very self, with the body and the blood of Jesus. Through this mystery, send us forth to proclaim your promise to a world so desperately in need, through the same Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. And receive the blessing of the Lord Almighty, Almighty God, who sent our, the Holy Spirit to Mary, who gave her a power and insight to ponder the great things of Jesus. It was proclaimed to her in angels, sent to her by shepherds, led to her by the magi of a star. May that same spirit bless you today and be with you in your home and in your life and in your ministry. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll do our sending hymn, uh, God Be With Me Till We Meet Again.
Go in peace. Share the gift of Jesus. Thanks, Jesus. Amen.